Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Awesome. So I'm Dave Williams. I'm the CTO of MassDriver, and I am a recovering DevOps practitioner. I started my career as a product engineer. I modeled domains with languages and frameworks, with databases and APIs. And as I grew in my career, I got pulled to the operations side. And I found narrow tool sets, copy-pasted pipelines, all held together with duct tape. Why is it that when we build the engine for our business, we throw out all those product tools? DevOps always feels the same to me. We start a new project. We make repositories for code. We make repositories for configuration. We make repositories for containers. We write YAML. We write boilerplate to pull in all of our IAC modules. And we write YAML. And we write YAML. And we write YAML. Now, inevitably, we end up in one of two scenarios. One, our engineers are doing all of this work, in which case they're encumbered by our tooling and all of the complexities of the cloud. The second scenario is all of these tickets are in an operations backlog, in which case you're not even doing DevOps. You're a blocker. It's work that needs to be done before the work that needs to be done. The primary goal of platform engineering has to be switching from ad hoc to on-demand capabilities. It's to lower the cognitive overhead of the cloud and managing infrastructure. And we can do this with just a little bit of software. Not even a lot of software. We've built all this stuff before. We all manage products. We can do it. So today, I want to talk you through some of what we're building at MassDriver and what you can implement yourselves into your own businesses to speed up operations, make it more effective. The first concept I want to talk about is golden blocks. I'm sure everybody here has heard of golden paths. They're too big. They require operations professionals to write big things and test them. At MassDriver, we use golden blocks. These are small units of IAC that encapsulate a single unit of architecture. We bake in security and compliance to lower that cognitive overhead. Let's walk through an example of what that might look like. At MassDriver, we don't deploy SQS queues. We don't want to lose data. Redundancy is not a flag. Redundancy is not an option. We're getting dead letter queues. That's just how it is. We're getting all of the policies to enable those dead letter queues to function. We don't do star policies. We don't say everything can read and write to this queue. We craft our policies within these blocks, and we pass them forward for downstream consumption. Read policies and write policies at minimum, always moving towards policy of least privilege without making our engineers think about it. And finally, alarms and monitoring are not an option. When a message hits the dead letter queue, there's an issue in our system, and we need to fix it. Our engineers shouldn't have to worry about how and what alarms they need to configure. They should just get them out of the box. So let's talk about lowering the cognitive overhead here. The way that operations can impose cognitive overhead is by imposing tooling sprawl on our engineers. I'm guilty of this. I use Helm for Kubernetes. I use CloudFormation for serverless. And I use Terraform for almost everything else. Should my software engineers have to learn all of those tools because I have a narrow tool set? I don't think they should. So at MassDriver, we've created an open source framework for wrapping IAC. On the front end, we create a JSON schema. This allows us to provide our engineers with simple forms. Doesn't matter if it's Terraform. Doesn't matter if it's Helm underneath. It's a simple form. We can provide rich pre-runtime validation. We can display fields given selections within the forms. We can create enums that let engineers know what instances they can deploy into what regions. We can do data conversions, because Kubernetes thinks in bytes, and my engineers think in gigs. We can make this form work out for them without having to do any math. After running our blocks, we produce what we call an artifact. It's just a simple block of JSON that's structured. It tells, our engine, it tells downstream services what we created, what policies and security groups they can use to connect, metadata, 
about what region something's deployed in or what service it's using. The cool thing about this is it enables interoperability between all of our tool sets. Think about your tool chain now. How do you get Terraform to talk to Helm? Previous companies, everyone copy pasted stuff and wrote it down on post-it notes and plugged it into a pipeline. Why do we do that? Everything speaks the same language now. And because everything speaks the same language, and the outputs of these modules go to inputs of other modules, we can visualize our infrastructure. Living documentation that is always up to date because it represents the state of production. Imagine your first day on the job where you walk in and not only do you see the relationships between every unit in a service, but also its configuration. It would be pretty amazing, right? Here's an example of what's created with these JSON schemas. My junior engineers can fill out that form. My 10-year veterans can fill out that form. Everybody gets the same experience. Doesn't matter what tooling's under the hood. I get to pick whatever I want. On the right side there, you can see an example of an artifact. It's really simple. It's structured. It tells someone what was created, any available security that they can use to access it, and metadata. All of this passed downstream without our, without our engineers even touching it. It just happens automatically. We can inject it into our applications or other infrastructure at runtime. So let's talk about what to do now that we have blocks. We need catalogs. We've built this a million times in product engineering. I was in e-commerce for a very long time. Built, built incredible catalogs that got users to the thing they wanted fast so they could spend their money. With just a tiny bit of code in a database, we can capture all those blocks. And we can make that discoverable. Think about what you have to do today to figure out what NoSQL databases are supported by your organization. I imagine you go to GitHub and type MongoDB and hope you got a hit. And if you didn't, you do DynamoDB. You just continue until you run out of stuff. Then you go talk to someone who's going to do the same thing. Catalogs allow us to figure that out. Not only can we say what NoSQL databases are available, we can say what databases are available. Right? At design time, we know what our options are. And like any good catalog, we can start to enrich this with useful data. Compliance scanning. I want to know that my database is HIPAA compliant at design time. Let's throw it in the catalog. If we're configuring alarms ahead of time, can we put run books in so everybody knows when an alarm goes off what you should do? You should. Read me's and learning materials so people know what to expect when they run infrastructure in the cloud to make sure they're making the right decision for their service. Our catalog can provide all of that. We should demand discoverability in all of our platforms. Let's talk about what to do now that you've selected the thing that you want to run. We need to provision it somehow, right? We're done copy pasting and we're done duct taping. At MassDriver, our provisioning system is build once and run over and over. You say, I want to run a block. I want to use Helm to do it. And here are my values in JSON I want to run. And we just run the same pipeline over and over. If we add new tooling, we add a new pipeline. But then never again, no copy pasting. So what do we do with our free time not copy pasting pipelines? We write software. We have a proxy, what we call an orchestrator, that sits in front of our provisioning. So no matter where you deploy from, we capture who's requesting a change, why they're requesting a change, what values they used for the change, the results of our provisioning run, and all of the logs and failures. We save all of that to a database. We now have point-in-time snapshots of an entire history of a deployed resource. And we make it available in the exact same tool that we use to provision. Can you imagine being able to go and say, what happened since last Thursday to this production database? Dave scaled it down. Let's fix that, spin it back up in one tool. How do you do that today? It's probably pretty painful. Let's create audit logs. Like, it's hard to deal with auditing. It's the most stressful time of the year for a lot of people. We have the power of a database. Select star from deployments where service equals checkout. Wouldn't that be lovely to use the power of querying to generate this? 
instead of going to GitHub and then going to Jenkins to make sure that everything that was merged actually deployed into production to get an accurate change history, let's use software. It's not hard. We do it all the time. Our products do this. Now, if there's one thing you take from today, this is where the rubber meets the road. Inventories. What did we create when we deployed? If we use Terraform, it's a state file on your laptop, maybe in S3, maybe. Who knows? If you use Helm, it's etcd. If you use CloudFormation, it's AWS. How do you know what resources you built and why? It's really hard to wrangle all that stuff together, especially in an environment using multiple tools. Inventories give you the context. In staging for this service, we have created this for RDS. You get this list of resource IDs. Save it to a database. Again, it's simple software. But the real magic happens when you start to use these resource IDs. I've used the same block to deploy something in staging and production. I have inventories in both. Can we go to the cloud and get all the configs for these resources and then compare them side by side so we know what the difference is between staging and production? How do you do that for full environments without these inventories? Let's talk about monitoring. How many people have watched an engineer try and use Datadog their first week on the job? I've been that guy, and I've been the guy that's supposed to help that guy. The fact of the matter is, to use our monitoring tools, we have to know a lot about how the system's built. That information is hard fought, especially when your documentation's out of date. Why do we do that? Like, we have an inventory. We can actually go out and fetch all of the relevant metrics for the resources that we've provisioned and show all of those metrics in context. We can explore them, right? No more understanding AWS namespaces for metrics. It's hard work. We shouldn't encumber our engineers with that. Now, with just a tiny bit more software, we can actually start creating alarms in context. Imagine being woken up at 1 in the morning, being brought to a living document that tells you, my database has a problem. These are the three services connected to it. I'm going to let those teams know they're going to have a quality of service problem. I'm going to correct the issue in the exact same tool and go back to bed. This is what we should demand from our platforms. Here is a hot topic on the floor. Let's talk about costs. How many people here have ever actually had a conversation with their business about how much a service should actually cost versus how much it makes? I've never had that conversation. You've had, yeah, yeah, I know you've had that conversation. But I never have. And the problem is the bill is hidden somewhere else, and I can't see it. And I definitely can't see it in context. With these inventories, we can collect all of our resources and figure out how much all of them cost. We can then bubble them up to an individual block. We can bubble them up to an environment. We can bubble them up to a project or a service. We can start to say, how much money should we be spending on staging, really? These are important decisions for businesses and for engineering teams. Now, the real magic happens in synergy of all of these things. Close your eyes and picture looking at this living document enriched with all this cloud data and saying, our CPU utilization on our database never goes above 50%. We can save $250 a month if we just scale it down a little bit. Making that change in a single tool and then watching the results. Metrics go up a little bit, cost goes down. We take the money and we have a pizza party. It's a good life. It's a very good life. So this is what we demand from a platform. Blocks that can create novel architectures very quickly. We want them to be easy to discover. We want them to be available on demand. And we want them enriched with real data and context. It's a single pane of glass to design, to deploy, and to observe. It's not a ton of software. But it's not as simple as just building it. It requires a very diverse set of skills. It's not narrow tools anymore. It's front ends, it's back ends, it's databases. It requires dedicated cycles and resources, which are hard to come by when you have a product that's actually making money. It requires a product mindset, which I know everybody says when they talk about platform engineering. 
But the thing they don't tell you is being wrong and iterating is not acceptable when there's other more important work to do. People get frustrated with you. And it requires a hefty budget, as my CEO will tell you. So if that doesn't scare you, to help you on your platform engineering journey, we're going to be open sourcing several tools over the next couple months that will actually help you implement some of this stuff in your own businesses. And we hope that you contribute to those open source libraries and help us shape the future of platform engineering. But if you want a shortcut, come and book a demo at MassDriver, and let's help jumpstart your platform engineering journey. Thank you, everybody, for your time and attention. I've been Dave Williams. Thank you, Dave. This was amazing.